Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. This week I'm using the My Favorite Things Pool Pond Stamp Set. This is a Stacy Akula design, and I will be using the ducks in the pond and the bulrushes and the grass and the turtle and the rock and all the things, right? to create a one layer scene card. This does require some masking and it also requires a little bit of pre-planning. So I have a piece of copy paper that is trimmed down to the size of my card front and I'm going to lay all the stamps out in the way that I want them to be on the front of the card and then I'm going to stamp them on my card panel and mask things off and create the scene card. One thing to note when you are creating a one layer scene card, the things you want to be in front have to be stamped first and then masked over and then stamped. There are a couple of places where I did not think ahead too clearly and did not um, mask properly. So you can see like the edge of the pond through the grass leaves, which, you know, I thought it would color and cover up a little bit darker, but it did not. So whatever, we're just moving on. <laughs> All right, now that we've talked about the coloring, or at least the card creation, we're going to jump into our crime. So our journey today takes us to Nevada. Now, Nevada became the 20, or sorry, the 36th state in the Union on October 31st, 1864. Um, Nevada is unique in that they telegraphed the Constitution of Nevada to Congress the day before the November 8th presidential elections. This became the largest and costliest transmission ever sent by telegraph at 175 pages. Nevada's statehood was rushed to help ensure the electoral votes necessary for Lincoln's reelection, um, which was necessary for the, you know, the, the solidarity of the union and the end of slavery. Let's just be honest here. Um, Nevada became the second of two states added during the Civil War, um, the first being West Virginia, and it became known as the Battleborn State because it was given statehood or granted statehood during the Civil War. And having lived there, it is Nevada, not Nevada, just so you know. And because Statehood Day is a state holiday, there's no school on Halloween in Nevada, just in case you needed a reason to move there, which I don't recommend, but that's okay. I liked it when I was there, but I don't go back. <laughs> so while Battleborn was the first moniker, the Silver State is the official nickname of Nevada due to silver deposits found during the gold rush. And oddly, the Silver State is one of the largest producers of gold in the world. <laughs> Nevada is home to the largest numbers of wild horses in the United States. And State Route 375 coming out of Las Vegas is known as Extraterrestrial Highway and is chock full of all things alien. So if that intrigues you, look up a land extraterrestrial highway. Um, you could pave a 16 foot wide highway from New York to San Francisco with the amount of concrete used to create Hoover Dam. Nevada takes being desert to a whole new level, getting only an average of 10 inches of rain each year, less than any other state in the country. And let's not pussyfoot around it. Nevada has a reputation of being home to all things less than legitimate, including things mafia related. And that is our story for today, the case of the missing bank teller. So we're going to start in the middle at the beginning. <laughs> we're going to start with Charles Jacob Frisch, who was born in Switzerland in October of 1852 and then immigrated to the United States in 1868. And Barbara Lynx, who was born in Germany in August of 1860 and immigrated in 1881. Their marriage date was not listed, but they are the parents of at least 10 children that I found anyway, six boys and four girls. And by the 1910 census, which was the earliest one that I had looked for, their home of record was Reno, Nevada. Now, Roy John Frisk, or Frisch, F-R-I-S-C-H, so we're going to call him Roy John, or just Roy, was born on the 16th of April, 1877, in Reno, Nevada. So clearly, as he was the second child, they were in Reno prior to the 1910 census. Um, like I said, Roy was the second child, and like a lot of people in history, their life was pretty 
um, obscure or unwritten about until that one thing that made them famous or infamous. What we do know about Roy's life is that he enlisted in the military in 1919, so just toward the end of World War I. Um, and he enlisted, was not drafted, so that's interesting. He, After his time in the service, he served as a Reno, a Reno City Councilman and a Washoe County Assessor. So Reno is in Washoe County, Nevada. And then Roy took a job as head cashier at a bank where he worked until, well, for the rest of his life. So now we're going to go back to the beginning, beginning. We're going to talk about a man named George Wingfield. George was born at Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1876 to Thomas Yates Wingfield um, and Martha Matilda Spraulding Wingfield. Now, George was from a somewhat prominent family. In fact, his grandfather, Edward, moved his entire family, so his three sons, their wives, and their children, from Albemarle County, Virginia, which is like the Charlottesville area, to Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1853. And then during the Civil War, he moved to Missouri, and then he went back to, then he went to Arkansas, and then he traveled through Nevada to settle in Oregon, only to move from Oregon to Arizona. Um, that's where two of his sons had settled and made their homes. So George has come from a somewhat prominent family. You can assume why the moving that they're probably wealthy, but also he must have been um, a pretty hard worker because by the age of 20, he was a cattle driver and he um, drove herds from Oregon to California and then into Winnemucca, Nevada. So Winnemucca is located in like the, the northwest corner of um, Nevada. And there was a railroad stop for the Southern Pacific Railroad there. So his job was to get these cows from California and Oregon to Winnemucca to be put on the railroad and sent eastward. Now, Winnemucca had a reputation in the early 1900s um, for having a variety of businesses out front in public on Main Street that were normally more hidden in more respectable towns. Things like saloons, um, gambling dens, brothels, you know, that kind of stuff. So while... There, on one of his cow herding trips, George met a former railroad man turned banker who ended up being a future United States senator, a man named George S. Nixon. And we're going to call him Mr. Nixon because we've got two Georges going on now. Now, Mr. Nixon became George's mentor. By 1899, George decided to leave the cattle business and he opened a saloon in Gol um, Golconda, but then sold it in 1901. Now, George had a plan. His plan was to make money. And after the sale of his first saloon, he moved to the new and upcoming town of Tonopah, Nevada. Now, this area was up and coming because in 1900, you know, just a year before, um, Jim Butler had discovered the silver ore and established a pretty large mine there. So this was an up and coming place. Lots of Saloons and brothels and gambling halls and all the things and you know the, the general stores and the hotels all the things that go with a mining town So George used this booming town to jumpstart his um, plan to personal wealth um, First he, he played poker and dealt cards in one of the local saloons and He and another gambler took over the entire saloon eventually and they made hundreds of thousands of dollars in profits and um, it was also recorded that, that um, sometimes George was a, a race. He um, not only bet on, but raced horses. So, you know, he did all the things he thought could get him a little bit of money to make a little bit more money to make a little bit more money. So after making hundreds of thousands of dollars in the saloon, George was that gave George the, the money he needed to become partners with the Nixon family. And they partnered in real estate and mining. Now, um, one thing to note is that the Nixon family already owned at least one bank at that time. So eventually, the George and the Nixon and Mr. Nixon and the Nixon family, they created this um, business and they owned the Boston Tonopah Mining Company and the Nye County Bank as part of their business organization. And by his 30th birthday, George was worth $30 million. 
30 million dollars. In 1908, George moved to Reno and became more active in politics, banking, ranching, and hotel keeping. He dissolved his partnership with Mr. Nixon in 1909 and George took the mining interests and the Nixon and Mr. Nixon kept the bank. Now, George continued to invest in mining and real estate, working toward his goals of wealth, like he had already got there, $30 million, holy cow. But anyway, after Mr. Nixon died in 1912, George was approached as one of the candidates to fill the remaining term on Mr. Nixon's gubernatorial, gubernatorial seat. Um, George spent some time thinking about it. He consulted with some friends and some businessman, businessmen. And eventually, he actually turned down the invitation. He determined it was necessary to remain friendly with both political parties for his plans in wealth to continue. He did use his influence, though, and this is an, an interesting point, but it comes into play later. He used his influence to help turn Nevada into a quickie divorce state. Um, and that helped his hotel business in the Reno area because, you see, all of the people moving to Nevada for this quickie divorce had to have a temporary place to live. Yeah, so he just built more hotels, right? Now, George goes on to make a lot of money and do a lot of things in the early 1900s. And then, during the Great Depression, most of his fortune was lost. Like most wealthy people in that time frame, he lost nearly all of his money. In 1931, there were $500,000 of state funds missing from his, from, um, I'm guessing one of a bank, a bank or a bank account. And he was accused, accused of embezzling them. He, um, put up his own money to cover that $500,000 loss, $500,000. He put up that money and then declared bankruptcy. But by 1935, he was rebuilding his fortune. So, you know, he's, he's living his dream, like he's got a plan and he's making it work. So what does one man with very little written history and another man with an extensive public image have to do with each other? Well, let me tell you, Roy lived next door to none other than George Wingfield and became head cashier at one of George's banks. Yeah, remember how we talked about how Roy took a job as a head cashier at a bank and worked there till the day he died, or, yeah, the rest of his life? It was George's bank. Now, another thing that we should probably talk about is that in the 1930s, Nevada wasn't exactly the beacon of honest business practices, and banks were used by legal and less-than-law-abiding citizens to launder money earned in less-than-legal ways in some of the more legal businesses in the state. While gambling was legal, loan sharking wasn't, right? Um, prostitution was legal, but blackmail wasn't. Get my drift? Now, George, George's bank was one of those banks used for money laundering. And um, a lot of the, here's my air quotes that you can't see, businessmen laundering money through George's bank had a peculiar tie to some families on the East Coast. Now, one of George's business partners was a man named Jim McKay, and Jim was connected or reportedly connected with some of those Eastern Mafia families. In fact, it was rumored that he often used George's hotels to hide some of his East Coast friends when they needed to lay low. So George, um, Jim McKay and George have a copacetic friendship here that, you know, um, Jim uses George to hide people and George uses Jim to make money. Now, this bank that Roy works at that is owned by George, well, it was used not only to launder money, but it became the home office of Jim's new business plan. Well, that business plan turned out to be a big con. And it, it was a Ponzi scheme that operated via 
the United Postal Service. And that con was what got Jim and his partners arrested and arraigned on mail fraud. They couldn't prove the con, but they could prove the mail fraud. So the federal government has, a, is, has arrested Jim McKay and his partners, and Roy, as head cashier, was witness to all of the illegal la money laundering and the mail fraud scheme. And Roy, well, Roy was set to be the star witness at Jim McKay's trial. And for a while, Roy even had police protection. And then for some reason, just as Roy's subpoena to appear as a witness was issued, the police protection was called off. Now, whether that reason was they figured the trial's here, he's been fine so far, nobody's attempted anything, all he's got to do now is testify, protection's not necessary any longer, or if somebody with political ties pulled a string and those police were called back. Who knows? However... It is March 1934, and on the 22nd of March, Roy has decided he's going to go to a movie. So he left his home in the 200 block of Court Street. He shared this home with his mother and two of his sisters. And at about 7.45 p.m., he began walking to the Majestic Theater to see a movie. Roy was seen walking to the theater. Nobody at the theater could say, yes, they had sold him a ticket, but they could also none of them say, no, they had not. So... Also, Roy was seen walking home, and in fact, on the corner of Sierra and Court Streets, just a couple blocks from his home, he stopped and exchanged a greeting with a friend. You know, hey, how are you? Good to see you. Have a good night. And they went on their way, except that Roy never arrived home. And Roy has never been seen or heard of again. And it is 2024. Almost 100 years later, nobody knows what happened to Roy. Now, in the days after Roy disappeared, there was a reward of $2,000 offered for information on his whereabouts. That's about $38,000 today. Um, and because of the legal implications in his disappearance and the illegal people involved, many, many theories um popped up as to what could possibly have happened to Roy. Now, the least menacing is that he got amnesia and wandered away and didn't know who he was or how to get home. For this to have been a real theory, I'm guessing there had to have been some kind of war or military injury that was common knowledge around the town. But I didn't see any, like, this is a theory that was proposed, but there was no justification or um, evidence behind the theory. So I don't know. But I'm just saying, a 46-year-old man doesn't just wander away because, like, develop amnesia at the movie theater and then forget how to get home a couple blocks from his home. Yeah, that's probably not a real theory. There was also a theory that he had been eliminated as a witness and dumped in Tonopah Lake. Um, there was also a theory that Roy was paid off to disappear. So, also given the people in play, that seems more likely than a sudden case of amnesia. The idea behind this theory was that William Graham and James McKay paid Roy to take the blame for their illegal activity at the bank, and then he took a payoff and took off to help avoid help them avoid prosecution. The problem with this theory is that most adults who willingly disappear don't stay missing. They eventually resurface. And like I said, not anything has been seen or heard of from Roy since March of 1934. The, the most, prob most probable theory is that Roy was killed to prevent his testimony. Let's just be honest here. We've all seen the movies, right? The weekend that he disappeared, however, a, a rather famous man named Babyface Nelson and his sidekick, John Chase, were in Reno. In fact, they were hiding out in one of George's hotels. And, and they left a few, town a few days after Roy disappeared. And they left town to um, team up with none other than John Dillinger and Rob Banks. Um, shootouts with law enforcement at bank robberies killed Dillinger in July of 34 and Nelson in October of 34. I think it was 34. And John Chase was actually captured and sentenced to a life sentence on Alcatraz. And yet 
in all the theories and in all the investigation, in fact, Tonopah Lake was um, drag, dragged, you know, dra dragged, is that the right phrase? Looking for um, Roy or his body. But in all of the investigation, clues were very scarce as to how or why Roy disappeared. About a year after um, Babyface Nelson's death, some of his gangster friends confessed that they had shot Roy in the head and dumped his body in an abandoned mine shaft. So now, you know, the mine shafts are being searched and still there's nothing coming up with what has happened to Roy. Now, while I was investigating this story or looking for more research, I shouldn't say investigating because I'm not, I was looking for more research on the story. I found the website Nevadagram and it is linked below. And there is an article written by David Toll, and T O L L, and he is wrote about a time in 1966. So, like more than 30 years after Roy's disappearance, he is sitting in a public park in Reno, and he's watching his children, and they're eating peanut butter sandwiches, and he is approached by a man, and this man asks him, "Aren't you a writer?" To which he responds, "Yes." And he says in the article that he does not remember the man's name or if the man even ever gave him a name, but this mysterious man recognized him as an, a writer. So I am going to summarize David's re recitation of the encounter with this mysterious man. So mystery man tells David that he and a partner were leasing a mine that was owned by George Wingfield and the mine had a water leaching problem. The water was leaching in faster than the current sump pump they owned could drain it out. So they had decided to install a newer gas powered pump. So mystery man related that one day he had gone into town to get groceries and other supplies while his partner was back at the mine in the shop preparing the new pump to be installed in the mine. From the shop, you cannot see the mine or the shaft. Um, his partner's wife, however, was in the kitchen of the house and she saw a black car with a driver in the front and three men in the back drive toward the shop and the mine and then drive away, but this time there were only two people in the back seat. So she assumed that this third person had been left at the shop with her husband. When husband came in for lunch, she asked him who the visitor was. And he says, what visitor? I didn't see any visitor. I didn't have any visitors. And she told her husband all that she had seen about the car coming in with three people and the car going out with two people in the back seat. Well, mystery man returns to the house and his partner and his wife tell him about the weird car and how it came in with three people and went out with two people. So they all went down to the shop and mine area to investigate and they saw tire tracks coming in and tire tracks going out, but nothing definitive to say that anybody had gotten out of the car or disturbed anything or had attempted to damage the mine in any way. And for reasons that can be inferred, lack of um, evidence and fear of bad guys, this mystery man and his partner decided they weren't going to say anything to anyone about any car and just went on with their mining. So they installed this new gas powered pump and it worked, but after a couple of weeks, um, it was not working as well. So they pulled the pump up and the filter was gummed up with something that they had not seen before. So they cleaned it out and then the pump worked again, but, and then eventually it needed to be cleaned out again. And this happened repeatedly over a few weeks. Now, mystery man wanted to know what was going on in his mind. And he luckily had met the acquaintance of a doctor who had moved to Reno to obtain one of those quickie divorces. So this doctor had moved temporarily to Reno into a hotel and brought a whole lab full of equipment with him. So mystery man took a sample of what had been clogging the filter out of the pump to the doctor. Eventually the filter on the pump stopped clogging and they stopped worrying too much about it. And one time when mystery man was in town, he did see the doctor and the doctor said, Hey, I have an analysis of that's been clogging up your pump hair, human hair, brown human hair. Did I forget to mention what Roy looked like? Well, on the website called the Charlie project, 
The Charlie Project is a website dedicated to finding or helping solve cold cases. Roy was described as a 46-year-old Caucasian male with brown hair, hazel eyes, a large burn scar on his left forearm, and pit scars on the right side of his upper lip. Is anybody else out there thinking it's kind of suspicious that a mine owned by George, leased by a mystery man, had brown human hair clogging its pump, and the witness of against people laundering money through George's bank happened to have brown hair and had gone missing. That's a lot of coincidences, and my brain, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm rather suspicious, but my brain does not like the coincidences. Um, fast forward 30 years. In 1996, the Reno police opened the case um, when a new theory surfaced. And this theory is that Roy was buried in the backyard of George Wingate's home, right next door to his own family home. So a unanimous donor offered to, to, offered to the police some surveying equipment that they could go and use some ground penetrating radar to survey the backyard of this house. So the police approach the owner of the home and the owner says, yeah, no, thank you. Now the police don't have enough evidence or reasonable suspicion to obtain a warrant of any kind. And the homeowner said, no, thank you. Now I should mention here that George actually died in 1959. So this is, you know, nearly, nearly 10 years before this. His wife and son are buried next to him. I did not like to see when his son passed away. So it is probable that in 1966, it is his son who owns the home and didn't want the survey completed. Also, I did not look into real estate records in Reno in 1960, 1996. So 59 to 96, that's like 40 years. It's, it's, probable that it's the son. Um, it's not necessarily guaranteed. Could be another family member. But anyway, whoever owned the home did not want the police using ground penetrating radar to go look at what's going on back there. Now, I'm just saying, if the police came to my house and said, hey, there's a probability there's a dead guy, a dead witness buried in your backyard, and we've got this ground penetrating radar being, or survey equipment being um, donated to us to just go look. We're not going to disturb anything necessarily right now. Um, I'm going to be going like, yes, please. I don't need, but you know, dead men in my backyard. The only reason I can think of saying no to that would be if I was responsible for something suspicious in my backyard, or if I was a family member of the person who put the suspicious thing in the backyard. But anyway, I digress. For whatever reason, the owner of the home did not want to have the police use the ground penetrating radar to look for Roy's remains. Um, for decades after his disappearance, Roy's mother and then later other family members left the porch light of the home turned on just in case he came home. Roy was declared dead in 1943, so not quite 10 years later. Uh, and this was mostly done so his mother could be given the insurance payouts that she was listed as the beneficiary of. Roy's family home is described as a Queen Anne style home, and it is still owned by the first family now. It is a commercial property and has been given historical status to help prevent um, destruction or and to preserve it. Um, so that's kind of awesome that the family still owns the home. I do want to say that there's not any evidence that George was tied to, implicated in, arraigned or arrested for the disappearance of Roy. Just want to put that out there. I'm just saying I have a suspicious mind and he was up to his knees in dirty banking and he had business with some less than savory individuals. That is all public records. So that I will say out loud. Um, so here's a picture of the finished card. I put no sentiment on it so I can use it later for something, whatever I want. And I have the other photos. I have a picture of Roy. This picture was taken about the time of his disappearance, not too long before. I also have a picture of his family home. And it does appear that it is still very well kept. Um, it's manicured and in good, good condition. And I found a picture of George. So this is from George's Wikipedia page. So he's not too much older than Roy himself, really. So crazy. 
Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed our story. I have a couple of other videos here for you that I think you would like. I've added that subscribe button. Please subscribe if you haven't done it already. Give me a, a thumbs up. Let YouTube know you like the video. Leave me a comment down below and tell me where your suspicions lie. And I hope you have a really fabulous day.